In this video, we're going to look at some of the biological applications of fluid flow. So we'll be considering the flow of blood around the human body. So before we start, just a bit of a warning. With these physical theories, we always have to simplify the systems before we apply them. So we're going to make some assumptions which dramatically simplify the flow of blood around the human body. And this does mean that we do lose out on some of the details in the process. So in the School of Physics at UNSW, we do actually have a research group which researches biophysics. They have a particular interest in proteins and membranes and modelling these and using physics to describe what happens in these systems. They make a lot less simplifications than what we're going to make in this video. But to be able to use the physics, we do need to do this simplification. So to start with, let's start by describing some of the biology behind how the human heart works. So the human heart, like the heart of all mammals, has two circulatory systems. It's got two jobs. First of all, it takes the oxygen-poor blood, which is full of carbon dioxide, from the body and it takes it to the lungs where it swaps the carbon dioxide for oxygen. It then takes the blood from the lungs back to the heart. It takes it back to the left side of the heart. And from the left side of the heart, this oxygen-rich blood is circulated to all the cells in your body. When it gets to its desired location, the blood swaps the oxygen for the waste product, carbon dioxide, which the blood then carries back through the veins to the heart. And so that is how the two circulatory systems work. We have blood flowing from the heart to the lungs and then oxygen-rich blood flowing from the heart to all the cells in our body so that it can do its job supplying those cells with oxygen. So the heart itself is a really strong muscle that consists of four chambers. We've got the left side and the right side. The left side is the one which needs to supply the blood to everywhere in our body. So to do this, the left side contracts a lot, decreasing its volume. The ventricle on the left side contracts, decreasing its volume, and this increases the pressure, pushing the blood through the arteries to our body. So typically in a human, our heart, when we're resting, beats 72 times a minute. And the, each of those beats carries 70 milliliters of blood away from the heart to the body. So typically we have about five liters of blood each minute flowing through our veins, which coincidentally is about the volume of blood in the human body. So it takes about a minute for the blood to circulate throughout the human body. So in the human body, as in all biological systems, we've evolved so that form meets function. With the blood vessels, the arteries and the veins and capillaries that carry the blood around, they all have smooth cells on their surface. So these smooth cells reduce the turbulence and mean that the heart doesn't have to do extra work to provide extra energy to carry the blood around the body. The arteries which carry the blood away from the heart are very strong ward because the arteries carry the blood which is under a very high pressure. The veins, on the other hand, have much smaller wars because veins carry the blood back to the heart and so it's not under as high a pressure. We saw in the demonstration of the Bernoulli effect that when we had the wide pipe, which was close to the tap, it had a higher pressure that, than the wide pipe further from the tap because you had to do work getting from one to the other and so the total amount of energy and hence pressure dropped. So as your heart beats, white when it contracts, you have the highest pressure. So your heart contracts, pushing all the blood out of the left ventricle to go around your body and then it relaxes. 
and when it relaxes it fills with blood so that it's ready to pump again. And so this means that there's actually pressure waves traveling through your arteries and your veins. You've got the maximum pressure just when the heart has contracted and pushed all the blood out and then it relaxes and the pressure drops off. So to compensate for this pressure change, arteries are actually elastic. So they, they can move a bit and they do this to try and reduce those pressure changes. So if you feel on your wrist you can actually feel this movement, which is how you feel your pulse moving through your body. So blood flows from the arteries, which are really fat tubes, the aorta is the main one coming out of your heart, into much narrower capillaries. So the capillaries have much thinner walls, and this is to allow the oxygen and carbon dioxide to be exchanged through those walls. So we saw that the volume flow of a fluid was constant. So the cross-sectional area times the velocity of the fluid through the pipe should be constant. So you may think, well, the velocity through those much wider tubes has to be a lot greater than through the narrow tubes. But this isn't actually true because when the blood flows out of the arteries, the arteries split up into a lot of papillaries. So the total surface area of the capillaries is actually much greater than the surface area or the cross-sectional area of that artery. So as the cross-sectional area is in fact increasing a lot, the velocity actually decreases. So the velocity of blood coming out of your heart through the aorta is about 48 meters per second. Whereas the velocity of blood flowing through the fine capillaries is about 0.1 meters per second. You actually need that slow flow of blood through the capillaries to allow time for the oxygen and carbon dioxide to be exchanged. The other formula that we've seen for fluid flow, Bernoulli's equation, is also important. Your height actually has a large impact on the pressure of the blood in your veins. So my head is around about 30, 35 centimetres above my heart. And in a minute, we'll calculate what change of pressure that causes. But this is why humans have evolved to faint. If you get low pressure, you faint so that your heart and your head are horizontal with each other, they're at the same height, and this means that the pressure at your head will be equivalent to the pressure at your heart. So typical humans have a pressure when the heart contracts of 120 millimetres of mercury. So those are the old-fashioned units which were first used to measure pressures. If we want to get from millimetres of mercury into pascals, we need to multiply by 133. When the heart is relaxed, the typical blood pressure is 70 millimetres of mercury. So let's now calculate the pressure difference between my heart and my head. So to do this calculation, we'll assume that my head is 35 centimetres above my heart. We're going to need to make use of the density of blood. So the density of blood can vary a bit but we'll take it as equal to 1,050 kilograms per meter cubed. We're going to make one other assumption. We're going to assume that the diameter of the blood vessels doesn't change between the heart and the head. So this assumption lets us use the rate of fluid flow equation, the volume rate of flow, AV is equal to constant, and this is the cross-sectional area, and if the diameter is not changing, then this isn't changing, so this is constant, so this tells us that the speed is the same at the heart and the head. So let's use Bernoulli's equation now. We've got that the pressure at the heart plus the density times G times the height of the heart, heart 
plus a half rho times the velocity at the heart squared is equal to the same thing at the head. So the pressure at the head plus rho g times the height of the head plus a half rho v squared at the head. Now we've just said that the speed is the same at the heart and the head. So these are the same and the density is not changing. So this term and this term are identical and so they will cancel each other out. So now what we need to do is work out how the pressure changes and that's going to depend on this height here. So let's rearrange this. What we're trying to do is work out the pressure at the head. So we're trying to find this term. So we've got that the pressure at the head is equal to the pressure at the heart plus the density times gravity times the height at the heart minus the height at the head. So now what we can do is we can substitute in. Now let's do it for the maximum pressure. So that's when the heart contracts. When the heart contracts, the pressure we said was equal to 120 millimetres of mercury, which is equal to 120 millimetres of mercury times 133 to get it into Pascals. Plus we've got the density of blood, which is 1050, times gravity, which is 9.8. Now the heart is 35 centimetres below the head. So the height of the heart minus the height of the head is minus 35 centimetres. So that's minus 0 0.35. So now what we can do is enter this into the calculator and what we end up with is 12,358 pascals. So if we want to convert this into millimetres of mercury we have to divide by 133 and if we do that we end up with 93 millimetres of mercury. So the pressure at your head is lower than the pressure at your heart as you'd expect because there's some drop in pressure to do the work to pump it up there and so the pressure up here is equal to 93 millimetres of mercury. And so when you faint your head and your heart are at the same height because you're generally lying horizontal on the floor and so rather than being at this decreased pressure of 93 millimetres of mercury, your head is now at the same pressure as your heart. And so that makes it easier for your heart to force the blood into your head, which is why we have evolved to faint. So we've considered the pressure difference between the heart and the head of the human. How about for a giraffe. So a giraffe's head is typically two meters above its heart. So a giraffe has a head pressure like a human of about 90 millimeters of mercury. And let's calculate what pressure does it need at its heart in order to have this pressure at its head. So we'll make the same assumptions as for the human, that the velocity of the blood flows the same because the, the blood vessels have the same diameter at the heart as at the head. So we've got the same equation that the pressure, except that it's rearranged now, the pressure at the heart is equal to the pressure at the head plus rho g times the height at the head minus the height at the heart. And we'll assume that the blood of a giraffe is fairly similar to the blood of the human. So the density of the blood is 1050 kilograms per meter cubed. So let's substitute everything in. The pressure at the head is 90 times 133 pascals. So this is the 90 millimeters of mercury and we're converting it to pascals plus the density which is 1050 times gravity which is 9.8 times now the head is two meters above the heart so if this is h heart this is h head and this minus that is equal to two meters so this is times two meters and so we end up with 32,550 
pascals, which let's just divide by 133 to convert it into millimeters of mercury, we've got 244 millimeters of mercury. So this has got a lot more blood pressure in its heart. So giraffes have very large hearts and very strong blood vessels to cope with this higher pressure. So the giraffe actually has some issues when it lowers its head to drink some water because then its head is below its heart and its head is used to having pressure which is quite a lot lower than the heart's pressure. So the giraffes actually evolved with a couple of mechanisms to cope with this. When the giraffe lowers its head, it's built in, inbuilt that its heart rate actually decreases to decrease its pressure. It also has one-way valves in its veins, so these let blood flow in this direction, but not in this direction, and that stops all the blood pulling in its head when it lowers its head for a drink. So the other issue for the giraffe is that it has very high pressure in its legs here. So its legs actually have very firm, strong skin on them and they're quite narrow to stop them swelling outwards under that much higher pressure. 